So we're back with Steve and we're here to talk about your recent trip to Canada and flying the Hawker Hunter with ITPS. Can you tell us about this and how it even came about? Yeah, sure, Mike. Um, I obviously have been involved with Hunters for a long time and it sort of got around. Um, and one of the chaps in Canada, he's actually a flight test engineer himself, had seen the interview uh, that I had done and also saw my book that was advertised. And he bought it, he enjoyed the book, and contacted me. He's an ex-South African living in Canada. And um, he just had, must have got chatting with the guys there. And then out of the blue, he called me up and said, listen, these guys have got themselves a hunter, which is Chief Fox from way back when and said that they'd like to speak to you about flying. Yeah, they, none of them had flown a hunter before. In fact, one guy had done a, some flying at um, Boscombe Down 25 years or something ago, and he did a bit of on a T7. But they still wanted to chat to me because they knew my experience. So I said, yeah, well, sure. I, the only thing is about it. It's got a small engine. I knew you the hunter with a big engine. They said, no, no, we'll have a chat. <laughs> and so that's what happened. There were the, the three of them. The two of them are the hunter pilots involved with RTPS. Tiago Makido, he's, he's the Brazilian. He was in the test project pilot, test pilot, and other guys, Alain, and he's a, a French Canadian uh, from the Canadian Air Force. And the third guy was an Australian, um, <laughs> very multicultural, but uh, multinational. But um, he, he was just the uh, deputy training manager, and they sat down and checked it to me. And as it turned out, we spoke for, oh, it must have been two hours. And, of course, the hunter's the hunter. The only difference was the power side of it. And they wanted to know about the handling characteristics and that. And, uh, yeah, at the end of it, the, they were really pleased. And, in fact, Loris, the chip of Basson, the chap who contacted me, got hold of me in a couple of days and said, no, they're very happy with that. And that was it. So now we're sitting around for two months, um, at least two months, almost two or two, three months, and I suddenly get an email from Tiago, the Brazilian project pilot. And he said, how would you like to come and fly the hunters me on its first flight? Wow. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> and um, he said, well, now we're going to try and sort out your licensing. Now, I've, I've got uh, a class two medical. I haven't actually got a current license. All I've got to do, the, the, the Australian authorities have given me the authority to fly the Hunter if I go and do what they call a flight review on a single engineer aircraft. Now, that could be a Cessna. No. <laughs> and then I, yes, and then I can jump into a hunter based on my. That's how they work it. They class hunters an experimental aircraft. So, with all the experience I've got, they just want to make sure I keep the wings level, I think, and then you can go and jump in your hunter. And at that stage, you can fly the aircraft, but you can't fly over cities. They don't mind you killing yourself, but don't kill our people, type of thing. So, that, that, so now I had, I had the class two medical, and I had the authority to fly the hunter if I'd done this flight test, which I haven't got a hunter to fly. It is another story behind that. But um, so he said, okay, well, send us all your information, um, my log books and my um, licensing and all that sort of stuff. And they came back and the Canadians gave me the hunter on my, based on my Australian airline transport pilot's license to fly that hunter. And that's the only license I've got at the moment. Wow. There's a Canadian license authorized to fly the hunter. And that was two weeks before I was due to go across. So bearing in mind, Mike, at this stage, I'm not their first choice, I don't think. <laughs> at age 75, I'm sure they looked around, I know that. And, um, but obviously, there are too many hunter pilots around at the moment to endorse, you know, who've got a license. So it, things happened very quickly from then on. Um, I got my license, um, I got all this paperwork, I got, uh, they asked me how much I want to be paid, and I said, that's a first for me, <laughs> because I probably do this for fun time. And I said, and I said, listen, you must have some sort of um, standard that you pay people. And they sent me this agreement, this huge contract, and it was very comfortable, you know. So that was chuffed. And the next minute, I got my my air tickets, and away I went. And um, yeah, we flew across uh, LA to Toronto, and um, I picked up. Our tr it just so professional. I can't explain it. Fine. Anyway, I arrived at the place, and um, I met. Um, um, the chap who, uh, Loris, who, who introduced me. And then on Monday morning, Tiago came and picked me up and took me to the airport. And this is now the project pilot. Young guy, 40-year-old Brazilian, lovely guy. And, and I've got to say at this stage right now, um, I think as pilots, we always put test pilots 
at a certain level, perhaps above us, because I know I've seen how much these guys have to study. And this is um, in Rhodesia. This is not even at a test pilot school. And um, you're sort of expecting a bit of an ego or something like that. Nothing. Just a lovely guy. Welcome. Come and see me. <laughs> Plus, looking at me at the 75-year-old as well, but it couldn't be more pleasant. And when I got there, I found the same with all these guys. And um, I, I then went and um, from there I went and met the boss, uh, uh, Giorgio Clementi. He's a South African-born Italian, uh, Italian-born South African, whatever you were around. And he has got 41 years in the industry. He started off in the South African Air Force as a technician, eventually became a flight test engineer. He, and I didn't follow his full story, except he was in it for a long time. For the last 30 years, he'd been flight testing in, um, fixed wing and helicopters. He then bought the company in the UK. Oh, wow. And it, you know, the Canadians must have given, given him a huge reward to come and set up his company there. So he took it across there. And it's now the biggest independent uh, test pilot school in the world. Um, and he's got a hangar full of aeroplanes. I sent you a photograph, I think, of some of the aircraft he's got there. And um, yeah, he said, yeah, welcome, you know. And he was very pleasant. And once again, very quickly I said to him, I know I'm just a tick in the box here because the bottom line is the Canadians haven't got – an experimental category. Hmm. So, yeah, you know, Tiago's got, he's flown 51 different aircraft. He's only 40 years old. He was a major in the Brazilian Air Force and a test pilot trained at um, United States Navy Test Pilot School and he flew T-38s, F-16s, F-18s, Mirage 2000s, all these, all these sort of things. So he could have jumped in and just flown. I know that. He knows that. Everyone knows that. But the Canadians wouldn't accept that, which was good for me because now they needed this pilot. <laughs> so I said it to both to, to Giorgio, the owner, and Giorgio, I know I'm just here for one purpose, and that's just so that you can fly the aeroplane. And they wanted it flying. It's taken four years to get to the stage. And I'll talk about the aircraft in, in a while. But um, So they, they, they had a schedule where they wanted to fly, and it was, that's why it happened so quickly. And, um, and they said, no, no, we appreciate you've come across here, and I'm sure – there will be uh, your help for us. I was actually pilot in command, even though I was sitting on the right hand side, mm. and there wasn't anything in front of me that could help me fly the airplane much. Um, but I was pilot in command and classed as a sort of safety officer, a safety pilot, if you want to call it that. And I said, I'm just happy with that. I'm flying in a hunter, I'm very happy. And you know, I wasn't going to go across saying, No, I don't want, I just knew that I was happy to be there. And they said, No, fine, I'm sure you can, you'll be able to help us. And as it turned out, it turned out to be true. I was able to quite a bit of input, and they accepted it. You know, um, very humbly, if you want to call it that, you know, because I at 75 wasn't going to try and push my way to it. But anyway, so, so that was it. It took a while to get in the work permit because things happened quite quickly. The weather was a couple of days were quite bad. And then we started the program. And it's so, I mean, you can imagine it, that you've got um, about 20 flight test pilots, including probably a third of them were flight test engineers. Hmm. And they training, while I was there, there were Turkish test pilots, or training test pilots. Um, RAF, I saw RAF, Canadian, Dutch, South African. Wow. Um, yeah, all these guys. There would have been about 30 of them there. And a huge complex with classrooms, little classrooms all the way around. And a lovely, uh, for our briefings, they've got this board, um, whiteboard, not a whiteboard, it's a big TV screen. And they can pick up NOTAMs, weather from anywhere. And there are a lot of airfields around. This is around London, Ontario, which is mm -hmm. about. 100 miles west of, of um, Toronto. And so it was just, everything was just so professional. So the, on, the, um, about the, on the third day, we, he, was, he, he taxied the aircraft before, Tiago had, but he wanted to do, the, um, to do a taxi test first with the parachute. But prior to that, um, I had to have, go through the, the Mir Martin Baker seat. It was a Mark IV, which I'd flown in the Mirage. And also in, in, a, in a hunter as well, but very professional. They had a full briefing, how to strap in on a seat out of the cockpit sort of thing. And that was that. And then I began to get my unit. My, you've seen my partner, but you want to see the photo of this orange oh, yeah. With, yeah. with my patch. The only thing that defined me from a criminal was the patch. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, was, I was coming out of a shop once. And they all wear the town and everything. And I was coming out of a pizza shop, and two ladies looked at me, and I said, don't worry. <laughs> I just had to escape to come and get a pizza. <laughs> so, really? so that was, and then after that, it, it, it's interesting because I'm actually carrying a, a, at least 10 kilos more than I should be. So now we're now going to get fitted out. Um, so then next was to get the, get the G suit on, 
the flight suit, and they wear a waistband, which is connected to the oxygen. It's quite complicated, the whole thing. Then, of course, the helmet and everything, all fitted fine. And uh, then we went to the Saturn aircraft. Now, you know, the, the old jet fighter is not the easy thing to climb into, that thing. But I thought, this is going to be interesting. But no problem. We got on the aircraft. And then the revelation was the cockpit. You've seen the photograph thing. Yeah. It's a completely gas cockpit. It's their own design, in fact. They're using, obviously, stuff from Garmin. I think it's Garmin. One, no, one company, like I don't know what the company was. And on the right-hand side, it's purely um, a, a strategic type aircraft. The aircraft, the, the Hunter, they call it, um, it's the F5 STA. And that's a fifth-generation surrogate training aircraft. Right. Okay. So so that, that's the idea. So these guys have designed this aircraft. And through Georgia being the, brain, the owner, it's his brainchild. Because they want to be able to train. They're flying with a lot of fifth-generation pilots there. You know, who've come fourth-generation, obviously. Not many fifth-generation. They've probably got a couple of F-35 guys. But mainly F-16 guys um, who've come across. And they want to be able to train them on this aircraft. So on the right-hand side, it's hot as. The, the, the controls are as an F-35. With all the, oh, wow. Yeah, hot as stuff, yeah. And in front of them is a screen that you would find on an F-35. And uh, the idea being, in the surrogate aircraft, they can train guys on a fifth-generation aircraft, but it's a hunter. So instead of having to go and buy themselves a fifth-generation F-35, they'll be training these guys as a surrogate aircraft. So the, the guy on the left-hand side, which is Tiago and Alain, the two hunter pilots, they sit on the left-hand side, and the guy sitting in the seat, the ter- training test pilots, they will operate the hot ass and all that sort of stuff. It's also got, it's got data link, with the ground. In fact, I, a lot of the stuff was gobbledygook to me at the time because we were just concentrating on flying the aircraft. Mm-hmm. This all came out afterwards. A guy, Loris, the guy I met over there, he sent me all the information about what it's got. And um, so, but Laura, but Tiago did show me that you can set up um, enemy targets on the screen in front of me and attack those targets through the hot ass. I know the whole thing, it was amazing. Plus, they also got a head-up display, which is not a head-up display, or even like the ones that they've got on like F-16. You know, they've got these ones, that, all the head-up displays, in the, in the, it's in an eye-gradical. If you look at that advert, the one I sent you, that, that, that video, it's an advert for SDA. You'll see yeah. Tioga, that's a pilot, sitting there with this thing. And it wasn't working at the time, but it's all there. And it's, so you've now got this... It's a 75, it's a 50, what did I work that? 67 year old aeroplane. <laughs> wow. Your setup, it gets, it gets yeah. more interesting. I don't know the technical side of it. The Hunter was AC and DC aircraft. And what they've done is they've taken out all the AC. So it's only a DC machine now. And they've integrated, they've got two really smart cookies um, um, who, who've done all the electrical stuff and two very smart engineers. One of them, South African guys, well. <laughs> who's worked on Hunters forever, and all those, those lightning that came out to Cape Town. He rebuilt those aircraft. Quite a young guy, he's in his mid-40s. Anyway, they integrated the whole thing and got it. It took four years to get to this particular stage. But the only two things I recognized, in Mike, in that cockpit was the undercarriage button and the flap lever. <laughs> 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 Nothing else. Even right. parachute, everything was completely changed. Yeah. Lovely um, uh, 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 master caution panel. Much like I used to have in the 737, I was flying for Qantas. Whereas in the old, uh, the legacy hunter, you had to look for the monster, the, the warning sign. <laughs> it all sits there in front of you now. So it was one of it, it's a huge um, junk for me. And also, the other thing I'm proud of the old hunter as well, because that aircraft is now their center point of, of their operation. They've got L 39s and they've got modern. Uh, other modern helicopters and everything, but everyone has a photograph taken at RTPS, they go in front of the hunter. Because but you see, it, it looks beautiful as well. That, it's still in the same black color scheme, color scheme, and they look after it like a baby. You know, they love the hunter, they really do. So that, that, that was, that's, so we got to that stage now, and now we're ready to do the taxi test, and now once again, I'm going to get in and see if I fit in this thing, and I'm, uh, you know, my feet fit, and I'm not in any way, because it's been 20 years since I flew the hunter in Australia. Mm-hmm. Comfortable, sat in it, strapped in, and it, in the dark because we had to do everything in the dark for the airport. Airports an international airport, so they, in case we had an emergency or something like that, we had to operate close to the airfield before they started other flying. So we we sat close to the airfield, so strapped in every morning in the dark. We did our first taxi test in the high speed with the chase plane flying over every hut to, to to photograph the whole thing, and uh, that went well. And the next day he decided we should go and fly. 
and do the, the practice first flight with the Nell 39. So I sat in this Nell 39, which is <laughs> probably one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever done. It's got an ejection seat, but I don't know, the, the Texas of Actions must be short little guys or something, because I sort of <laughs> 180, six foot two, and it, anyway, it worked. We got in, we did the whole practice to, to test flying, flying close in formation, so we see the gear coming down, checking speeds. This is test pilot realm, way out of my, my league. Uh, all I was given was a, we did a full brief and everything, but I was given a lot of scribing to do. So we practiced that for the first day, and then the next day we were coming to do the flight. And that was first thing in the morning. Um, oh, the whole the whole of ITPS was there. At, I think we, we taxied out at six, and there was a mist. Um, so we were a bit worried about the mist, because it's quite common there apparently. But it made everything beautiful. You think of these lovely photographs of us. It, the mist was off the runway, mm-hmm. but we, you know, we're taking off into the mist and we got lovely photographs. But it was just, I mean, it was just so exciting man, to go out there. We went out, the chase plane came up, he took ahead of us, came and took the photograph. Now, bearing in mind, this is something I've never come across before. I, I, doing air tests for me was just writing stuff on a piece of paper. We've, yeah. now, got, <laughs> <laughs> we've now got a full computer sitting next to me, uh, picking up all the information. We've got GoPros all around us, and a little old me scribing in the corner, just for anything else, extra you know, t- that was going on. And, uh, of course, we took off. And in our Air Force, we didn't have two-seaters. Most of us came off quite a manual-type aircraft. And as you took off in the hunter, everyone would come to watch the aircraft in Rhodesia taking off because the blokes all waggled their wings because it's got slight flight controls. But, of course, Tiago, with his experience, we went off beautifully. Nothing went wrong at all. We did the whole flying. It was a lovely sunny morning. In the photo, you have some of the shots on the video of us flying around and gear coming down. Everything worked beautifully. And he came into the grease of landing. He knew exactly what speed he took off at because the computer told him afterwards exactly what speed. Everything was just was monitored as per really professional outfit, you know. Wow. And as we texted, of course, the whole, the whole, all the RTPS are there. It must be about 50 people. And the boss of Georgia was beside himself because he'd been waiting for this thing to happen. And as we got up, of course, everyone clapped and everything. And Tiago got out his side, and he got dumped with water. Thankfully, I got out my side, and I didn't get any water dumped on me. But they had a big party and a lovely breakfast and everything like it. It was just, I mean, it's one of the nicest experiences of my life. I'm talking about I'm a 75-year-old, you know. And it was about that time, after the second flight we did, I, during the second flight, I remember, I remember saying to Tiago, you know, I keep, I keep on pinching myself because I, I never thought I'd be in this position again, in this professional position again. I mean, we did it here in Australia where all the guys put the hunter together and we flew it and it worked fine, you know. But here, everything's done just by them. It is so professional. And to be in that position, to be in that sort of professional environment was just amazing. It really was. But I thought, I, I, and I, about that stage, I thought, you know, I should have thought more about this because, you know, I'm 75 years old. I've had all these, I've had operations, I've had this sort of stuff, and they still want me to come and fly on top of thing. And I didn't, I didn't even question it. I just jumped in the wind. Yeah. And the yeah. nicest thing about it, Mike, is we were driving home after the second flight, and um, he was driving me somewhere, Tiago, and he said to me, I said to my wife this morning, I couldn't have had a better guy sitting next to me flying the Sunset. And I'm sure that wasn't his first thought when he first saw me <laughs> and even had to invite me. And I'd said to my wife as well, yes, I couldn't have had a flown with a guy more humble, but also brilliant to have flown with, you know. And so it was that just love. We, we had a lot of laughs, even with the chase plane pilots. We got rid of the chase plane after the first flight because he was too slow. We just, every time we were doing sort of flying, just got way behind. So Tiago said, the plane's flying fine. We'll just do it. In a, uh, you know. mm-hmm. And we expected problems. The engineer said to me afterwards, you know, <coughs> He said, well, after they got those lightnings flying in, in Cape Town, they had a lot of problems. You know, all sorts of snags. And he said, I cannot believe this. I'm sitting on this aeroplane now, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, after all the changes they've done to it, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it, just to give you a graphic example of one of the changes, the, the automatic on the air conditioning on the Hunter was amazing. You know, you could, whatever, you had, whatever speed, uh, you could boil yourself, or you could have ice down at you. And it was all done automatically on AC. But now they took the AC out, so now it had to be manually. So it was our sort of our emergency system that they now use as a normal system. So the, just to show you the, the difference of the aircraft from what I'd flown from what it is now. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it, it, then things got a bit more interesting because I was only supposed to be there two weeks. But they, the Canadians required 
me to do the flight testing, and I had a class two medical, but the chap who was going to do, there was another guy to do the endorsement flying, um, which was for Tiago and Elaine, who were going to be, Elaine was going to be the, 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 chief, the training pilot, and Tiago would be the project pilot still. And they needed another guy. Now, they've got a guy organized from, he flies the Dutch Hunter, the private Dutch Hunter. He's an F-16 test pilot for the Dutch mm-hmm. Air Force. And anyway, as it turned out, the Canadians, they were trying to, they were trying to get me to get my first class, my medical, which we were trying to organize that, but then I could do both. The Canadians said no. And so they got this Black Patrick across. Lovely guy again. This 55-year-old test, uh, F-16, current F-16 pilot. And he came across and he just fitted right in with all his experience uh, of stuff. And um, we just worked, all of us worked together. I, I did the first three flight tests and then he did about another, he did virtually 10 hours. Tiago did 10 hours. That's what was required by the Canadians. Then I went back and did three more flights, one with Tiago and two with Elaine, the other guy, hmm. on the test flying side. But it was interesting during that time that I, I asked if I could sit in on their briefing. Um, because I was in, uh, for the, and while they were doing that, um, I would just try to keep quiet, you know, because these, these are heavies now. You could all these ex, uh, 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 landed for an F 16s for a long time, saw Drakens, all this sort of stuff, test blind, and Tiago had flown F 16, F 18s, and of course now you've got a current test pilot uh, uh, who was uh, Patrick. But every now and again, they would say something about the hunter, and I would say, eh, no, you can't do that. This is a, a, a second-generation airplane. You can't do that because it'll bite you. Right. For example, right. you take the you take the power from the hunter right to idle, like after after landing, and then you want to go around. You put your power; it's going to take you up to eight seconds before it winds up. So, for example, they were playing with flapping wood. I said, mm-hmm, I wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> it's not you because the, the F-16. You just do that, and it's it's a turbo fan. It'll just the power increase. So, and, and Jim Patrick agreed with me at one stage. He said, yeah, I nearly got caught out on final once. Taking the power off to right to reduce speed and then turning final and then trying to get the power up again to hold the speed. No, the plane didn't like it. And he, he, he granted him, he admitted that, which was wonderful. I mean, that shows the, the, the humility and the professionalism of the pilot. So those type of things, I tried to keep it as quiet as I could. But every now and again, because it's, it's second generation aircraft, it'll bite you. You know, if you, the Hunter's a pussycat. And, and, they, and, and a lot of the stuff that we were taught about the Hunter in Rhodesia, and we were dumbed into us because we didn't have a two seater. So we didn't fiddle with stuff that, that like close to the stores or spinning and that type mm-hmm. of stuff because if you got it wrong, it's going to hurt you. So anyway, then we went through that and. Um, it, it just went so well, everything uh, uh, along the way. And the, the interaction, you've got a Brazilian, a French-Canadian, an Australian. He, the Australian was just, on a, um, he was like, the, he sort of over, over, uh, he kept everything professional, I suppose, and standard. And then you've got the Dutch guy. And we all got on, just got on well together. It was really, really remarkable. In the middle of it all, once um, we went to a couple of barbecues with Giorgio, the owner, and one day he said to me, listen, we're going to do a fly past on the L29 on Saturday, and you can go and sit in the back seat with Williams. Williams was a French test pilot. He'd been, I think he might have been in charge. I'm not sure he's in charge of the French test pilot school. Well, not school, but their, their, their establishment. But he had retired. He was doing contracts there. So <coughs> typically, he was by a short guy. I sat in the back seat with a SL-29, and Giorgio took up another guy. We did a fly pass for one of his employees had passed away. Hmm. I did a fly pass over there. I did the pull-up and that type of thing. And I got to do a bit of formation. And I had done it for 40 years. And the wonderful thing about it, Giorgio was looking back after we landed. And he said, when I look back, I saw, um, uh, saw Steve fly and said, I think he's done that before. <laughs> so that <was> like, <laughs> but lovely stuff. And Williams was, he, I flew the whole break and landing and everything. And he was going to let me land, but I couldn't see in front of me because the seats in the L29, yeah. you know, and my feet were completely asleep on that stage because they got no height adjustment. So all they do when you sit in the seat, they, they take out cushions until you're the right height. And I had this little cushion about this size. So my legs had gone to sleep in the bucket. Anyway, that was another uh, interesting part of the whole, the whole exercise. And um, yeah, so we, we went through the right through the whole thing, and um, now I'm coming to something unrelated to the hunter, which became really fascinating for me. In the hangar, they've got all these different aircraft. First of all, there was this one 
horrible looking little single engine, low, low slung wing aeroplane. And I said to Tiago, I was with him once, I said, what in place is that? He said, it's horrible aeroplane. And he said, it's perfect for us. These guys, these, these, these test pilots, trainees, have to do fly 15 aeroplanes in their um, year at the school. They end up with a, I better get the written down, they end up with a graduate, um, uh, it's, they end up with a degree in a master of flight testing or something degree. And they've got to go through this whole process. So they're going to fly these 15 aircraft and evaluate each one. Oh. And he said, that one's perfect because it's so horrible that they've got a lot to play with. <laughs> 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 then I saw over in the corner an uh, um, L-39 on Jacks. He said, come and have a look at this. This is a fly-by-wire L-39. So what they've done is they've taken out all the controls, all the original manual controls, and they put it in the computers, and it's going to be fly-by-wire. And what it'll do, it'll... Um, It'll, by being fly by wire, they can make it handle any which way they want. So, to, for the first flight, the guy goes up and it's an L39. So, they just tweak it up, L39, and it flies like an L39. Next day, they make it literally unstable or not tuny stable. And the guy's got to evaluate that and what they can do to sort that out. The next day, they change it again. So, it's once again, it's one of Giorgio's. Brainchild is he's made this. Instead of going and hiring 15 aeroplanes to come and evaluate, he can make the L39 do whatever he wants on the day, basically. Yeah, amazing stuff. Then they had a long ease, you know, the, the little long ease aeroplane. It's a, a little home book with a cannon in the front, it's a small okay. home book. Yeah, anyway, they made it a drone. So now they're training drone pilots, test pilots, in a, in a room somewhere. They have to have a pilot. The Canadians won't let them fly with a, uh, just as a drone. There's got to be a pilot sitting in it, which is fine. But they get to everyone and they fly this drone thing around, you know. It, and then the next I read mean, a couple of days the weather was while the guys were training. He said, you must come and see our mixed reality simulators. And we go to this, and it's a big room with about, I would have seen it, at least six F-18 cockpits. And it's, you know, like I've got my... Um, uh, set up here my virtual reality. Now that's what it is, but it's on steroids. So now with my one, I have to link the controls, like undercarriage and that type of thing. I bind it to my my controls. That one there, they can actually touch everything in the cockpit. So I climbed into this thing, and I can fly it. So now they're teaching strategic test, uh, if you are called test pilots, strategic test pilots. And they're doing that now a lot with the uh, Turkish, I think, is, they're using it. And also a lot of the Malaysia, the, in, in the um, far, far East countries with their Sukhois and their MiG-29s and all that sort of stuff, they can train them on this, this aircraft. So that was fascinating as well, the fly of this aircraft. And um, there's just so, so much stuff going on there, you know. It was very, very interesting, the whole exercise. And um, so, we, uh, so eventually I stayed there. I was only supposed to say two weeks. But Georgia in one stage said, listen, we'll have you as a backup. So I was there actually four weeks in, in all. And um, it, it, what was nice for me as well, being, an, being a technician to start with, when I wasn't flying, I was out there with the guys, with the engineers, and uh, um, just enjoying what they were doing and yeah. learning from them. And even to the extent we were working with them, when they, I told you about air conditioning, we went flying one day, and it was so hot in the cockpit, we thought the air conditioning had broken down. <laughs> and it wasn't because now we're working and basically we're working in manual, not in an emergency. And what it worked out is we, we went we, to, to make it work. You've actually got to select it and hold it there for a while to let it cool down or let it heat up. And so between the engineers and myself, we had a bit of a check and we come up with a potentiometer or some sort of indicator to show you where the valve was. So all you had to do was then move the switch, the emergency switch, if you want to call it that, to the valve position, and then you get, the temperature is going to be perfect again. Mm -hmm. So the whole interaction between everyone there, and it, I mean, everyone was, it was just, I can't emphasize enough how easy it was, how pleasant the guys were. And uh, Georgia's wife, um, Beverly, her name was, she's very much involved in coming to the crew room, because a lot of guys there, we, sometimes in the crew room would be, would be things doing every round, there would be 30 guys in there, you know, having tea right. or right? And everyone, all different nationalities, all speaking English, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but she was there, she'd organized the fooding, and just the whole atmosphere was just really relaxed for a very professional outfit. <clears throat> I did mention at one stage, but all I saw, it took a week for Tiago to write the report on our first flight. Wow, okay. 
<laughs> and I just said to him once, I'm glad I was <laughs> smart enough to be a test pilot because <laughs> we, you, there's a lot of lot of scribing to go on. But the guys are dedicated. And sitting where I was sitting, and it was for me, it was it, 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 a fighter pilot paradise because I was sitting here, I guess the guy was on holiday. Next to me was a MiG-29 pilot, a Romanian, a real character. His wife was also a test pilot, helicopter test pilot. Wow. And he was a, a, a bit, just a character like the, 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 the people from Balkan Zari, but really full of nonsense. Tiago was next to him, a Brazilian, as, as, as the project pilot for the hunter. Then there was another guy, next, another Brazilian next to him. And over the way were a couple of English guys, helicopter pilots, Israeli helicopter pilot. F-16, um, Elaine, who was the wow. F-16, yeah, just brains, you know, and just yeah. talking to this guy, talking, for example, talking, I've always loved the drop, and I love the look of the drop, and, and to be able to speak to someone who actually flew one, you know, it was, mm-hmm. it was just really so fascinating. But come back to the end of it, all of it, I just I only went there to be the oldest hunter pilot flying in the world, Mike. <laughs> I mean, that is absolutely incredible. Uh, <laughs> But to wrap up this piece, because uh, I don't, you haven't really mentioned it. I want to know what was it like first getting back in that hunter for the first time? Did it all just come and flooding back? Uh, like, what was it like? I know the controls were different and the systems, but it must have been incredible, Steve. Well, the first thing is you. I think you mentioned to me once before, right? The smell. <laughs> it's the same. The smell, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same smell. It was. It was just. I, it probably took me until the second flight, and so I really, I remember saying to you, you know. I'm in heaven here. This is just, to be able to think that I'm flying this hunter again at this stage of my life is just amazing. I didn't get to do a lot of the flying. The controls, of course, were very different. They were like an F-35, basically, on the right-hand side. And the instruments were all on that side. And actually, after the second flight, we had a big meeting of all the technical guys and everything. And I said to him, you've really got to be able to change one, bring one of those instruments into front of this guy here, even though he's not operating the aircraft. If anything happened, there's no way. I actually did one circuit. Um, and it was really difficult to try and look across to the instruments which are on the other panel mm. and to try and get the speeds and everything. So from that point of view, it was it was very different. But just sitting in there, having that noise, having that acceleration, it wasn't, I, it, I could even, though I hadn't flown a hunter for 20 years, I could feel it wasn't the same thump we got out of the big engine one, but still it was the hunter, you know. And we started to go and watch them come in and, and doing go-rounds and even, it's just, a, everyone used to come out and watch it. It's just a beautiful aeroplane to be around again you know it's and that's why i said you all the first you see how many times i've flown this airplane and it never gets it never get tired of it you know it's just amazing airplane. absolutely amazing airplane. yeah yeah i mean it's still an absolute beauty um but i have seen like a few photos um i think i had the traditional round nose but i've seen um i think one or two photos with a, a sort of corn pointed nose what's all that about yes. I think that's what he, I think even now, I think he wants that. The guys, when they bought it, they put it on. It, I think it, I don't know the last time it flew, it came from Sweden. That's where it was. That's where he mm-hmm. bought them. He bought two. He bought two T7s um, from Sweden, and the ones there as spare. And he put that nose in, and I, I believe he still wants that nose. I'm, I'm not convinced, I'm not sure of that, but the guys managed to get the old nose back on again. And it actually... Probably will stay. Um, it depends on Georgia himself how he wants to end up. I, I prefer it with the original nose person. Yes. As opposed to the pointy one, yeah. When yeah, I first, yeah. in fact, when I first got the photograph of the aircraft, this is before that, when they asked me to do the talk with them, way back in the beginning, that was the photo, the, 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 the nose I saw. I'd actually envisage going across to watch the first flight, would you believe it? Because I get, I, I, flew with, I still get cheap flights. So my friend Laurel says that, he said, yeah, come across, you can come stay with me and watch the first flight. Never thinking that I'd actually be in the first flight. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, incredible, and yeah, I'm very jealous. I mean, that's that's an incredible. Like, you're never going to forget this experience, there, Steve. But uh, one last question for me before we wrap up. <coughs> Apologies. <clears throat> Did you ever get to hear the blue note on the hunter again? Um, you remember not there because that's only got two guns, and that I'm not sure that's not configured that way. They're going to have guns or anything like that. But the, as I understand it, Mike, the blue note comes from the four guns. Oh, okay, it's organ, right. It's, a, it's an organ pipe sound. Yeah. So it's going to be the right speed. The last time I heard one was actually at the Campbell in 2001 at the, when there were 15. Oh, yes, one. yes, yeah. And the, one, the, the Swiss are doing these very fancy maneuvers type of thing. And eventually, I think it was uh, Wade came across and he's misdemeanor. But he got this, 
And the guy in front of me said, that's what I came for. I wanted to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I understand it. It's a, it's a, there were a couple of things that came out of it. Georgia, when he first saw me, he's, he'd seen my interview on, with, with yours or whatever. And he said, you flew the Mirror see. And I said, yes. He said, I want one. <laughs> 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 now, they, we, we, I've looked for a while to see. There are a couple not available. There are a couple around. But the, the wonderful thing about it, if you manage to get one, is that Canadians will require that the pilot trees fly in the middle of the seat to sit in the back seat. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Another thing, when I went back from that flight, a chap who's got two hunters in South Africa, he sing to, the bus was one single seater and a two seater. And suddenly he got hold of me, he said, Listen, have you got an instructor value on that thing? I said, Yes. He said, I'm, I'm co owned with another guy. He's a pilot. He owns an airline there. And he said he wants to learn to fly the hunter. You know, would you be able to accommodate him? I said, yes. <laughs> so they're trying to get me a validation now. To, so once again, you never know, right? It's, it keeps on going, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It, 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 was, it was nothing. I, let's put it this way. I never felt anywhere out of the depth in any shape or form. And the, the way getting in the cockpit, getting out of the cockpit, moving in the cockpits, flying the aircraft, nothing that felt uncomfortable. And in fact, as time went on, I felt more and more comfortable, if I could say that, more and more comfortable that I was where really, I should be tapping. So I'd be happy to do it all over again, whatever, you know. So Absolutely, it's just yeah. a wonderful experience. Yeah, wonderful experience. Brilliant yeah. stuff. But can we find uh, ITPS online to follow their journey? Do they have a website, social media, anything like that? Yes. And, you know, I think if you just Google IT, I think I've done it. ITPS, it'll come up as a website, yes. And I can't say enough about the place. Um, the professionals and the whole thing was just amazing. You know, uh, it was... Uh, it was just like, I mean, like being back in the airline in a way, you know, how everything just works as it should do. And they yeah. do everything, they don't cut corners or anything like that. But also the humility, which I couldn't really get over because I, it was just, everyone was just so down to earth, if I can say that, you know. It was, it was really, really good. You yeah. know, fantastic experience. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, Steve, thank you very much for coming back on the show and sharing your story. I'm sure people go and uh, check out ITPS and follow their story because it sounds fascinating. But uh, thanks very much, mate. No, you're welcome. Mark. Anytime. Sorry, if I can spread their word a bit, that'll be good for them as well. That's great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Cheers. Yeah, take care. Bye. 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 Bye.